Um, thank you for joining us here at my alma mater, Howard University. Um, some people are asking why are you um, bringing everyone together here, and it is because um, Howard University is um, one of the most important aspects of my life, and it is where I first ran for my first elected office. Um, which was freshman class representative of the Liberal Arts Student Council at Howard University. So this is where it all began. And with that, um, thanks for joining us, and I'm happy to take any questions. Senator Harris, a question and for you. And I'll let Lily's going to be the bad guy and decide who gets. A question for you on transgender rights. Uh, yes. Many progressives have expressed concern about your role as California Attorney General in defending the California Department of Corrections mm -hmm. and seeking to deny gender reassignment surgery for two transgender inmates. How would you address those concerns? So um, I was, as you, as you are rightly pointing out, the Attorney General of California for two terms, and I had a host of clients that I was ob obligated to defend and represent, and um, I couldn't fire my clients. And there were, unfortunately, situations that um, occurred where my clients took positions that were contrary to my beliefs. And, um, and there, it was an office of a lot of people who um, would do the work on a daily basis. And do I wish that sometimes they would have personally consulted me before they wrote the things that they wrote? Yes, I do. But the bottom line is the buck stops with me. And I take full responsibility for what my office did. But on that issue, I will tell you, I vehemently disagree and, in fact, worked behind the scenes to ensure that the, the Department of Corrections would um, allow transitioning inmates to receive the medical attention that they required, they needed, and deserved. Do you think that transgender inmates throughout the country, and uh, should they have access to gender reassignment surgery? I believe that we are at a point where we have got to stop vilifying people based on sexual orientation, and um, we've got to understand that when we are talking about, in particular, the transgender community, for too long they've been the subject of bias and, frankly, a lack of understanding about their circumstance and their, their physical needs in addition to any other needs they have. And it's about time that we um, have a better understanding of that. So. I was wondering if you could address your position on Syria and the president's recent actions there. Uh, if you were in the White House, how would you be handling that situation differently and what are your concerns for the people that are there now? Well, my concern is that there have been human rights abuses that have taken place there. My concern is that we cannot conduct our foreign policy through tweets. My concern is that when we make decisions about what we will do in terms of our military presence, much less our diplomatic priorities, that we do that in a way that will involve consultation with our military leaders, in a way that will involve some kind of consultation or at least outreach to our, our, our allies around the globe, and that when we then make those decisions, the American public can have a better sense of confidence that it is the right decision. So as much as anything, I'm concerned with the process by which the President went about doing um, what he has done in Syria. Ed. Oh, hi, Ed. Uh, thanks for doing this. You hear your alma mater, you're doing this on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, some of your colleagues who are either thinking about doing this uh, or exploring it or appearing at MLK events across the country. I'm just curious, um, black voters didn't turn out in the kind of numbers that they did in 2016 as they did back in 2008. What does your party need to do differently in 2020 to ensure that they show up? Well, for all voters, we've got to reach out to folks. We've got to go where they are, understand um, who they are. We have to listen as much as we talk, and that is certainly what I intend to do as a, as a candidate for the President of the United States. It is my full intention to travel this country and to sit in living rooms and to listen to families and let them express their concerns and their needs and understand that when we take on these positions, it is about representing all of the people of the country. And we must understand that based on where they are, be it geographic region, be it gender or race or ethnicity, there may be a diversity of issues and concerns, and we should be in tune to those issues and concerns. And fundamentally, we also should understand that the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And so I say that to say what I know to be true, which is when people wake up in the middle of the night, be it a mom in Compton or a mom in Kentucky, 
She's waking up having the same concerns about how she's going to be able to raise those babies, how she's going to be able to pay the rent at the end of the month, how she's going to be able to retire with dignity. You're an American woman, but you're also Indian American. And I'm just curious. Indeed. What's the best? How do you, how do you, how do you describe yourself? Did, Did you, you read my book? <laughs> How do I describe myself? I describe myself as a proud American. That's how I describe myself. Senator, Senator Joe Biden has said that the test should be who is best able to defeat Donald Trump. Right. That's the test. Why are you the best capable, strongest Democrat to defeat Donald Trump? Well, Andrea, let's start with this. I love my country. I love my country. And I feel a sense of responsibility to stand up and fight for the best of who we are. And I'm prepared to fight, and I know how to fight. And in particular, when we're talking about fighting for the values that we hold sacred and dear, when it comes to talking about how we fight for the American people and have leadership in this country that is focused on the needs of the people instead of self-interest, I'm prepared to fight that way. And I believe it will be a winning fight. Or other Democrats say that they love their country. Why are you better than they? I think the voters will decide. Ultimately. Ultimately. Oh, hi, Senator. Uh, hi, hi. I was wondering, what do you view your path to victory as? And uh, what do you think separates you from other progressives in the race? Well, I'll start by saying I think that there are already and will continue to be great candidates who are entering this race. And I think the process will have much more integrity. The more people who um, want to run and, and, and feel a sense of responsibility for our country um, jump in. So I think that this is a robust um, signal of, of who we are as a democracy, and I think everyone should run who's thinking about running. Um, in terms of a path, the path is going to be through all of the states that are the 50 states of the United States. The path is going to be about talking to people who are right now aware that this economy is not working for working people. It's going to be about talking with people about the fact that right now we have an administration that has waged a full-on assault on American values and American ideals. It is going to be about speaking truth, especially when there has been so much that is contrary to truth. It is going to be about working to regain, regain the trust of Americans and understanding that they have a right to have a government and to have leaders in this country who see them and care about them and have some curiosity, curiosity about their circumstance in life and, and, and their needs, be it for their family, their neighborhood, or their community, or their country. Uh, a number of Democrats believe that uh, the president has already committed impeachable offenses. The facts as you see them now um, would you support impeachment, and what would you need to see, if not, to, uh, to get behind it? So um, you may know, I think you do know, that I'm on the Senate Intelligence Committee, so I can't talk about the facts that I know, but I will say this. Uh, my highest priority, and what I believe should be the highest priority, at least for the United States Congress, is that Bob Mueller be able to finish his investigation. Um, there are already 33 indictments that he has returned. Clearly, he is following the facts where they lead him. And there should be no interference with that process because the American public has a right to know what actually went on. And then we'll make a decision. And certainly that decision will be made in the courts, but it is also possible that decision will be made by the United States Congress in terms of what consequence should occur. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, a lot of The Hilltop. Yes. Yes. Um, a lot of college students are feeling discouraged right now about skyrocketing tuition prices. Yeah. And do you have any um, words of encouragement or policy plans that could help curb those negative deals? Absolutely, and thank you. Um, I read The Hilltop every day when I was a student here. It's one, it is an incredible piece of journalism, and thank you for being there. Um, there's no question, you're absolutely right. Student loan debt is one of the biggest challenges facing our country and facing our students. And I've met so many students who have talked with me about the burden that they carry that is not only financial but is emotional. It is, it is a burden of wondering whether they should actually complete an education and have a dream about what they may be able to do professionally because at the very moment they can't pay their rent if they're going to pay off those student loans. And it, so a number of things. One, I believe, what we have to do is also have a commitment to what we need to do around debt-free college and college for all. 
Um, the other is what we need to do around changing the system in such a way that students can refinance their debt and currently we don't have such a system. And another is frankly the work that I did even as Attorney General, which is that we also have to go after predatory, in particular for profit colleges that have been peddling misinformation to students, getting them to pay a lot of money and go in debt without a degree that allows them to get any kind of employment. So there are a number of issues, but to your point, it is one of the most challenging issues facing our country, and a lot more attention has to be given to it, and I intend to do that. Hi, Senator, over here. Um, hi, hi. Thanks for doing this. I'm, I'm curious, when you look back on your record as a prosecutor in California, mm -hmm. are there particular decisions that you made or your office made that you either regret or would do differently, knowing what you know now? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell you of cases where I really regret that we were not able to charge somebody that I knew molested a child, but the evidence weren't there. Um, there are cases, as I mentioned earlier, where um, there were f folks who made a decision in my office and had not consulted with me, and I wish they had. But again, I take full responsibility for those decisions. Um, but I will also say that uh, there is a lot about what I did as a prosecutor that I'm proud of, including a recognition that there are fundamental flaws in the criminal justice system and that this criminal justice system needs to be reformed, which is why when I was district attorney, I created one of the first reentry initiatives of any prosecutor's office in the United States. Now, this was a long time ago. Thankfully, at this point, this is, the, this is the way that things are done, and people understand that's how a prosecutor should think about their work, which is let's be smart on crime, as I've said. Instead of deciding either you're soft on crime or tough on crime, let's understand that if we're going to be smart with the taxpayers' dollars, let's get people out of the system instead of cycling through the revolving door of a jail. Um, but there is work that we have done there. There's work that we have done around racial profiling and in particular implicit bias and racial bias in the criminal justice system and in particular in law enforcement that needs to be addressed. So there's a lot of work that we have done. Um, one of my biggest regrets is that I've not had more time to do more. But it is my intention to keep fighting for it. Your campaign, the government remains partially shut down. There are yes. more than 800,000 people who are still not getting paychecks. What would you see as the path forward now in order to resolve this impasse, given what the president's kind of set, set out as the, what, what he wants to see in order to do that? We need to get the government back up and running. It's really simple. Many of you were around just before Christmas. We passed out of the United States Senate unanimous bipartisan agreement about what was needed to get the government funded. I mean, I've joked, but it be, I've joked about the truth. We were literally singing Christmas carols on the floor of the United States Senate. That was the mood. There was an understanding that we were going to do the right thing and that the government would do the right thing, but the president refused to sign it. He is now holding the American people hostage over a vanity project that he calls a wall, while 800,000 people are trying to figure out how they're going to pay their rent, how they're going to pay their mortgage. It is completely irresponsible. And those folks don't want a wall, they want a paycheck. So let's be clear about what should be the priorities of this administration. Get the government back up and running. And then, yes, let's have a conversation, a robust conversation, the debates where we need to have them on what we need to do to pass comprehensive immigration reform, because that conversation has got to happen. But we don't need to hold folks hostage to have that conversation. It is irresponsible. I just, Larry, uh, some candidates who are running on economic inequality as the core issue, some on climate change. For you, you talked about telling the truth. Is that what the core issue is for you? Is that what it all brings back to? What is it that, that the core of it? The core of my campaign is the people. It's about the people and understanding that as with any one of us, we all have lives that are complex. So on the issue of climate change, every parent wants to know that their child can drink clean water and breathe clean air. And that same parent wants to know that they're able to bring home enough money with one job to pay their bills and pay their rent and put food on the table instead of having to work two and three jobs. Every person wants to know that there will be a criminal justice system that is fair to all people, regardless of their race. Every person wants 
that a mother and father should not have to sit down with their teenage son and have the talk and tell that child about how they may be stopped or arrested or in some way profiled and potentially shot because of their race. These are collective universal priorities. And these are the priorities of the people of this country. Nobody is living their life through the lens of one issue. And I think what people want is they want leadership that sees them through the complexity of each of our lives and pays equal attention to their needs. Let's not put people in a box. And I think as they make their decisions, let's give them for credit for being smarter than that. On one of those issues, does that mean that they're thinking too narrowly? I mean, I don't, I, I'm going to assume nobody is thinking about only one issue. Um, so I, I think that there will be a process where we're going to have healthy debates about many issues. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you're from Oakland. Yes. You spent most of your career in California. How does that inform you as a candidate, and how does that relate, allow you to relate to voters in Iowa and New Hampshire and all over the Midwest and the rest of the country? Sure. Um, I lived for a very short period of time in Wisconsin. Don't leave that out. <laughs> I could barely talk, so I'm not going to, I don't want to overemphasize or exaggerate that time in my life. But, um, Here's what I would say about California. I am a proud daughter of Oakland, California. And I also know that in that state of almost 40 million people that the state is as diverse as our country is. We produce half the fruits and vegetables consumed by the United States in California. We have red areas, we have blue areas, we have purple areas. We have a, a whole collection of folks who are, span every demographic that a pollster would talk about. So California is a diverse state. I will also say this. I've traveled our country, and I know, again, I know that regardless of the state in which someone lives, the core issues that are their concerns, that weigh on them, that cause them to wake up in the middle of the night, are usually the same concerns, regardless of where they live. It is usually a concern about how they're going to pay those bills. How are they going to pay the rent? Are they going to be able to retire with dignity? Can they pay off those student loans? These are universal issues. And here's what I would say as a final point on that. We are a diverse country, yes. And some people would suggest that in diversity, when there is a diverse population, one cannot achieve unity. I reject that notion because this is my belief. Yes, we are diverse. And we have so much more in common than what separates us. And when we emphasize that commonality, when we recognize that commonality, we will achieve greater unity. And in particular, greater unity that, than we have right now, where there are so many powerful voices who are trying to sow hate and division among us. We have got to reject that. It is not reflective of who we are as Americans, and it is not in our best interest. Our unity has always been our strength, and our strength is our unity. I feel that very strongly. All right, thanks, Brandon. And there you go. Okay. Thank you for being here. This is the president of Howard University Student Association. Hi, guys. Hi.